Sentry Squadron 2 to Chimera. The scouts are exiting hyperspace and en route to you. Did you get the data, Squadron New? We were able to get a partial data dump before we were pursued by New Republic forces, but I think we lost them. I hope so, Lieutenant, or the Grand Admiral is not going to be happy. So what Grand Admiral are these Imperial pilots talking about? Well, Grand Admiral Thrawn, of course. One of only a handful in the Empire who were bestowed the rank by Emperor Palpatine himself, and Grand Admiral Thrawn, the red-eyed, blue-skinned Chiss, is the most famous of them all, and the most dangerous. In the book Heir to the Empire by Timothy Zahn, published in 1991, it is about nine years after the movie Return of the Jedi. The Rebel Alliance has been reconstituted as the New Republic, but the war with the Empire is not over. Although the Empire now holds a quarter of its former territory, the New Republic is stretched thin. One of the most fascinating villains in Star Wars makes his first appearance in this book. And in this video we will cover the first battle in Star Wars lore where Thrawn's tactical genius and extremely dangerous nature is well established. The planet Obra Sky, strategically positioned on the edge of the Inner Rim in the Borderland regions, is the site of a massive library with knowledge about the history of the galaxy. The New Republic has sent an emissary there to make a bid for Abroa Sky to join the New Republic. The Imperials have just attempted to hack into the vast archive and achieve a partial data dump. The Imperial Star Destroyer Chimera is the ship that Grand Admiral Thrawn decided to make his command ship. As the scout ships report the possibility of pursuit, Captain Pelion orders the sentry ships to yellow alert. Captain Pelion reports the situation to Thrawn, who has converted the Admiral's executive suite, two decks below the bridge, into something like a combat information center, a personal meditation chamber, and a holographic art gallery where Thrawn is already studying the enemy in a state of deep thought. He tells Captain Pelion that he doesn't believe the scouts did lose the pursuers, and soon enough a nervous bridge officer reports that they are under attack, and Thrawn tells him to calmly report the situation. The force consists of four assault frigates and three squadrons of X-Wings. Captain Pelion believes this is a very dangerous task force and instinctively orders the Chimera to prepare for retreat. I will explain why he is so concerned. The Assault Frigate is a 600 meter long warship. It is a heavy modification of the old Rondilli Star Drive Dreadnought class heavy cruiser, which were already very tough before any modifications. But those old ships, although heavily armored and armed, were also slow and they required an enormous crew to operate. In the time of the Galactic Rebellions, the Rebels needed a warship that was able to outmaneuver Imperial capital ships and with less crew requirements than the old Dreadnoughts. They lightened the Dreadnoughts by stripping off much of their armor and added a better sublight drive system. They also probably added a better shield system to make up for the lack of armor. A small task force of these could encircle something like a Star Destroyer, mitigate the damage from the heavy turbolasers, and attack the Star Destroyer's flanks but even four of these ships wouldn't be enough to deal with the Star Destroyer and all 72 of its various ties without serious losses. That is where the X-Wings come into play, and while three squadrons of X-Wings is probably about half the number of ties available on the Star Destroyer, however they are still X-Wings. X-Wings are shielded and heavily armed, while TIE Fighters, although more maneuverable, are unshielded. If the X-Wing commander knows what he is doing, and most New Republic pilots by this time are far more skilled than their Imperial opponents, he can play to the X-Wing's advantages and defeat the TIE Fighter force. And most X-Wings are also armed with a complement of Proton Torpedoes. These weapons are very effective for surgical strikes against capital ships, so they would be able to assist in attacking vulnerable parts of the Star Destroyer. On top of all this, the Empire has seen better days. The Chimera's crew is young and inexperienced, many of whom are conscripts, so you can see why Pelion's order to retreat is not cowardice, but good tactical instinct. But Grand Admiral Thrawn calmly belays the retreat orders, and instead orders the Chimera to full battle readiness. The Admiral activates his holographic tactical displays. The ETA of the attacking force is only 12 minutes. 
Paleon is so nervous he questions Thrawn's decision, who calmly tells him to watch and learn. Thrawn orders the nearest sentry ships to attack, and one of the sentry ships almost immediately winks out of existence, and he orders the sentry ships to withdraw, seemingly very pleased. Paleon suggests that perhaps they should call for more ships to support the Chimera. Thrawn has none of that, and he doesn't want to prematurely show his hand by revealing to the rebels his command of several Star Destroyers. Thrawn then orders the sentry line to move behind the attackers and jam their transmissions. He also orders the Chimera to rotate so that the top of the Star Destroyer faces the attackers. He shuts down the amateur questioning of the inexperienced bridge officer by saying, You don't have to understand, just obey. He then orders TIE Fighters to launch, but stay on a vector away and below the Star Destroyer, while reinforcing the shields facing the attackers. Captain Pelion begins to recognize this as the classic Marg Sable maneuver, nothing particularly new and first devised by the Jedi Ahsoka Tano in the Clone Wars, and Pelion doesn't believe the attackers would fall for it, but Thrawn believes they will. Before showing you the Marg Sable, we must illustrate the details of Thrawn's analysis. Thrawn tells Pelion, Learn about art, Captain. When you understand a species art, you understand that species. He is almost certain that the commander of the task force is an Elomin, a species known for their ordered and linear thinking. Clearly, this is something Thrawn had already studied, and he's familiar with the art and culture of the Elomin. He was able to know this based on the behavior of the X-Wings. The first indicator is the symmetric V cloud formation a good formation that probably looks something like this. A pointed formation works well for X-Wings, which have inferior maneuverability compared to TIE Fighters, but better shielding and usually better firepower. Such ships would do well on a head-to-head -head engagement with TIE Fighters, provided the TIE Fighters take a direct approach and stay in front of the X-Wings. The Element Commander does the classic Element thing, and is executing a good attack, but a linear attack, like a massive arrow that would normally mow down the TIE Fighters without having to dogfight with them. Only against a Marg Sable maneuver, there is no head-to-head -head engagement with TIE Fighters. In a Marg Sable, the fighters move back along their launch vector, use superior maneuverability to maneuver around their capital ship, and like the falling cascade of a water fountain, attack from all directions. In this situation, the X-Wings would have no choice but to dogfight, and would begin to take heavy losses. Now, in the book, the details are imprecise about what happens next, and I can offer a theory based somewhat on World War II naval tactics. The New Republic commander, after having realized that his fighter force was by then practically eliminated, panics a little. He now knows that his assault frigates would be extremely vulnerable to fighter attack. Although this isn't illustrated, he probably maneuvers his ships to a broadside position so that more defensive laser turrets can deal with the inevitable TIE fighter and bomber attack. This is a mistake and I will show you why in a moment, but first I want to point out the power of psychology here. As the old saying goes, no plan survives contact with the enemy. That is a bit of an exaggeration, but the point is, if you're a linear thinker and cannot adapt to a changing situation, this can lead to impulsive actions rather than calm, adaptive action. A Star Destroyer's weakness is that it can be outmaneuvered and targeted in vulnerable spots, but the Element Commander's fear of the TIE Fighters leads him to forget this, as well as one of the Star Destroyer's biggest strengths, its giant heavy turbolaser turrets, all of which are now facing the assault frigates, which are showing the Chimera their broadsides, making them a nice, easy target to hit. The TIEs can now leisurely execute a flanking attack on the assault frigates while the heavy guns of the Chimera go to work demolishing the assault frigates one by one. Now, according to the text, about an hour later it was all over. More than likely a couple of the assault frigates had to make a hasty retreat and survive, further reinforcing Thrawn's decision not to reveal the other Star Destroyers under his command just yet. Later, after the Broa Sky data dump has been analyzed, Thrawn explains to Pelion that this is an important piece of the puzzle. The data shows information about a strange planet called Merkur, a planet that the Jedi for hundreds of years have avoided, and 
why they have avoided it. The other piece of information is the location of the planet Wayland, which is yet another piece of this very important puzzle. Palian asks Thrawn what puzzle he is referring to. In Thrawn's own words, The only puzzle worth solving, of course, the complete, total, and utter destruction of the Rebellion. Well, thank you for watching, Space Friends. I gotta say, this project had a lot of dead ends and puzzles I had to solve. I was trying a few new things in this one, so it took a while. But hopefully the next one, I won't run into as many dead ends. And no doubt this series will continue, with at least a few more battle breakdowns from the Thrawn Trilogy. Until next time, Space Friends.